Hi, I'm Poon, a late diagnosed 26 year old autistic human being from France living in the UK and I make videos about my own experience as a late diagnosed autistic person and this is actually the second video in my humanizing the autism diagnostic criteria series. This video is all about stimming which I've been very excited about because stimming is a fun topic to talk about and it's become an important part of my life actually since discovering that I'm autistic. So this series that I'm making, Humanizing the Autism Diagnostic Criteria, is about making these very cold, scientific, often negative descriptions of autism more relatable, more human, more personal um, through the lens of an autistic person rather than the probably neurotypical people who actually wrote the diagnostic criteria. And so I made a first video, my first video was about special interests, so you can go check that out. And I started the video by reading the official description in the DSM-5. So I'll do the same thing with stimming and then I'm gonna make a bit of an intro about stimming in general and then I'm gonna go into detail about my own experience with stimming and what my stims look like and my relationship to them and whatnot. So let's get into it. So on the DSM-5, stims are actually described as stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech. For example, simple motor stereotypes, lining up toys or flipping objects, echolalia, idiosyncratic phrases. I feel like I, I, I've seen several versions of the, the DSM-5. I don't know, uh, it might not be phrased exactly like that in every version of the DSM-5, but basically that's what stims are. And they're part of the second part of the criteria, so part B, which is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities as manifested by at least two of the following currently or by history. And it says examples are illustrative, not exhaustive. It's very important to specify. Something else I didn't mention last time is uh, that after the criteria, there's a whole section about how symptoms must be present in the early developmental period, but may not become fully manifest until social demands exceed limited capacities or may be masked by learned strategies in later life. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairments in social, occupational or other important areas of current functioning. And these disturbances are not better explained by intellectual disability, intellectual developmental disorder or global developmental delay. And in case you're wondering, I'm reading all of this from embraceautism.com which is a great resource. Basically, this is their page on decoding autism in the DSM-5. I'll put a link to it because I think it's great. They go into detail about each criteria and what it actually means and stuff. So if you're interested, I, I actually didn't read that while I was getting my diagnosis, but I think it would have helped a lot. So stims are um, an interesting topic, especially for us late diagnosed autistic people who masked our autism for most of our lives and learned to hide or suppress a lot of our natural behaviors, including stims. Some of us have kind of lost touch with some of our stims. Let's say that instead of stimming in ways that were most natural to us, like rocking back and forth, we kind of adopted stimming behaviors that were more neurotypical friendly, if that makes sense. For example, rocking back and forth is a really natural stim for me, but I understood pretty early on that it was just not gonna be socially acceptable, so I reverted to some more discreet ones that I'm gonna get into later on. 
And when I started the process of uh, getting diagnosed, I re tried to reconnect with my stims. So it's been a few months now since I started this whole self-discovery process and it's a work in progress. It's not over, it keeps evolving, it keeps changing, I keep discovering things about myself. I didn't know about or that I had repressed. A lot of my natural stims have been coming back to me and I'm sure that if I was making a video six months from now, a year from now, there would be new stims or different stims that I would include in this video. But this is where I'm at right now in my life. So the main reason why people tend to suppress or mask their stims is because of shame, or stigma, there's a lot of trauma associated with that. Maybe you've been, you were made fun of or criticized or stigmatized, ostracized for your stims. And people said you were weird because of them. So you stopped doing them or, or you did them only in certain circumstances. And I felt like for me, relearning to stim, it's made my life just a little bit more comfortable. I can definitely tell that it helps me regulate my nervous system. When I'm in stressful situations, especially out of the house, I now get the urge to stim a lot more than I used to. And I noticed that it actually helps. Whereas in the past, I would have just been stressed and didn't know what to do about it. I should also specify, I kind of did when I read the, the DSM-5, but not every autistic person stims. It's, it's a very common trait, but once again, you only need two out of four of the second part of the diagnostic criteria in order to be diagnosed. Someone could only have special interests and sensory sensitivities and have no insistence on sameness or stims and still be diagnosed. So just so you know, if you don't identify with any of the things I'm saying about stims, it doesn't mean you're not autistic necessarily. So in my journey of rediscovering my stims, I purchased a lot of stim toys and I've been using them daily and took them with me on holiday. I made a whole video about my stim toy collection. If you want to check that out, it's grown since then, it keeps growing. I always have a, a stim toy in my hands. So now I'm gonna get into what my stims look like and I have separated them into several categories to make it easier, mainly related to the senses. So sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, vestibular, facial stims, vocal stims, and mental stims. So you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm probably forgetting things. I mean, I have so many, it's hard to count them all. And sometimes there are things that you would not necessarily think of as stims that are stims. So I may be forgetting some, it's not an, a completely exhaustive list, but it gives a pretty good idea of, of what stimming looks like for me. And I'm, I'm also gonna insert clips of myself stimming so you can see what it actually looks like in, in action because I feel like a lot of the content that is posted on social media about neurodivergence tends to be a lot of theory, a lot of talking and less practical things, less showing of things and I think we need to show more of what being autistic looks like instead of just telling about it because it can it can help people. I know when I was in the process of getting diagnosed I wanted to see videos of people stimming and stuff like that and there aren't that many so that's why I want to make I want to try to make like vlogs and stuff um, like day in the life kind of thing day in the life of a late diagnosed autistic person because I think those things are, are so helpful. So the first category of stims that I wanted to talk about, these are completely in, in no specific order, by the way. Uh, the first sense that I wanna talk about is sight. So I have visual stims. For example, when I'm on my computer, my laptop, 
I like to, and that's borderline OCD, but I like to um, put my cursor, pointer, I don't know what it's called, uh, like in between two lines. So like when I'm watching a video on YouTube, for example, it has to be in a very specific place, like, like equidistant from two lines in the middle of something it can't be in, in a random place basically that's more like i guess that's more of like that's more ocd than stimming uh but when i'm also like we have lots of blinds on our windows in our house and whenever i'm talking like i mean right now i'm looking at the window and there's blinds or in our bedroom when i'm talking i like to like align the blinds with things in the sky or visually like just yeah like i often find myself looking at looking through the blinds and trying to align things with the blinds i don't i don't I have no idea if i'm making any sense right now uh, but that's a visual stim of mine uh something else that i find very relaxing and satisfying is uh, colors and color combinations when something is the perfect shade of purple i don't know it's like it's so satisfying to me and it's a big visual stim and that's why I love, some people say that they find stim toys um, too childish because they are colorful and stuff, but I actually like that a lot. So for example, this um, slinky that I have, I just love the, the color on it. It's a big part of the stimming experience for me to look at the colors like this as well, uh, things like that. Like colors are a big thing for me when someone has when two people are color coordinated or like they're wearing clothes that are the same colors or complementary colors i don't know it just it just uh it just does something in my brain video games are a big visual stim for me especially the more repetitive games like mario bros or the horse management game that I used to be addicted to when I was younger that I talked about in my video on special interests there's something it, it's very repetitive it's always the same repetition of actions that you have to do and I find that very soothing it's almost like meditative um, editing videos is the same for me I just find it very soothing, very satisfying. Also like watching flames. I know that some autistic people like to watch the the drum of the washing machine go. Uh, for me, it's, it's flames. Yeah, whenever we would make a fire when I was younger, I would watch the flame. I could watch the flames for hours. And I was also obsessed with like matches. I would light matches and just watch them burn. I just, I, that was a very big visual stim for me. Another similar visual stim is like watching animals in their natural habit, habitat, natural behaviors. Even if it's like boring, like I could watch horses or cows grazing grass for hours. I find it so soothing or like water drops falling down the window rain or snow falling down like any kind of natural thing like that any kind of repetitive thing that happens in nature is very satisfying to me uh, the next category is sound and honestly the main thing for me when it comes to sound is ASMR and it's a big part of my life and it's one of my biggest stims. There are a lot of autistic people who don't like ASMR at all and I get it. I also have misophonia, like certain sounds really trigger a lot of anger in me so I don't know, I know what they're talking about but for some reason, like for example if I hear mouth sounds in real life or sometimes if I fall asleep listening to ASMR and then I wake up in the middle of the night and hear mouth sounds in my ears, I'll get that really angry reaction. But when I deliberately put on ASMR, it's like deliberate, you know, I'm in control of it, it's my choice and I'm in the right headspace for it. Mouth sounds don't, I can, I can find them actually very relaxing. Uh, but be beyond mouth sounds, there's a whole world of ASMR out there. I've been listening to it for 10 years. I'm just very, I'm very, very, very sensitive to ASMR. I get tingles very easily. It just, it's one of the best things I can do to relax when I'm stressed 
or even that I, I need some comfort. ASMR is big for me, especially like people whispering, um, talking about things, describing things, tapping, tapping sounds, or like crinkly sounds, or like sticky sounds. Like I'm, I love that I listen to ASMR every single night, sometimes even during the day. Like when I'm working, I actually used to experience ASMR as a kid, like way before I discovered it was actually a thing on the internet and it had a name. I would experience so much ASMR whenever someone would like touch my hair, scratch my back, like write things on my arms. Like it was the best feeling. Oh, so the way certain teachers spoke in school. I got, I got so relaxed from that. Next category is smell. I have a big stim of like smelling or sniffing everything which I've been made fun of. I don't always notice that I'm sniffing things, but like I'll, I'll constantly be sniffing my fingers and uh, or, or sniffing food or sniffing objects or whatever. Like I sniff a lot of things. I interact with my environment a lot through touch and smell. And there are also like smells that I find very, very satisfying. But I find I find that sometimes it's difficult for me at least to differentiate between stims and like sensory seeking, hypo sensitivity and like seeking certain sensory experiences, which I'll talk about in my next video in this series, which will be all about sensory sensitivities. I'm a big sensory seeker when it comes to certain things and sometimes I feel like the line between sensory seeking and stimming is, I mean, there's, it's kind of the same thing sometimes. There are certain smells that make me feel great, like the smell of Christmas tea or the smell of like, like wood burning, the smell of horses, like there's so many smells that I love that I guess could be considered stims, but also like kind of like sensory seeking. I don't know. It's not clear to me. The next big category is touch. So like I said, I like to sniff everything. I also like to touch everything. So I like to feel things a lot. And I'm often like feeling something with my fingers repeatedly without necessarily realizing it. Like I'll feel a certain texture over and over again. And sometimes like when I see someone's clothes or accessories or hair, I get the urge to like touch it and feel it. I have to repress that obviously. Or like when I'm walking, I'm walking outside, I I like to touch the wall or the, the plants that are that I'm walking by and it's that it's the kind of thing that you know when a child does that no one no one thinks it's weird but if you're an adult then it's not socially acceptable to do that or you look a bit strange when you do it uh also like like i said i loved it when people would touch my hair or write on my arm or my back like scratch my back as a kid that was a big touch stim for me. Uh, another one is skin picking and biting. I've had um, uh, my skin picking stim for as long as I can remember and it's one of the stims that I got the most stigmatized for. I don't know if you can tell, it's not like super obvious but I will scratch and bite the skin on the inside of my thumbs here, sometimes until it bleeds and like this this hole this whole part of my thumb will be raw it hurts but like in a good way just like people who like to pull their hair it's a good kind of pain if that makes sense so sometimes it will hurt a lot and or even bleed and then i'll press on where it hurts and it's like a good kind of pain i know it sounds really weird but my dad used to stigmatize me a lot for that he used to say things like if you don't stop biting your skin it's never gonna grow back, things like that. Since it was my biggest stim and I had a lot of uh, stress in my life, I I couldn't really stop. I, it's not something that I can, that I can stop doing. Um, there have been periods of my life when I wasn't as stressed and I didn't do it as much. Yeah, it kind of comes and goes. But when I was younger and still to this day, when whenever I'm doing it, 
I have this reflex of like hiding it. I've like developed tricks so people won't see it. The, the way I hold my hands, like I don't know how to explain it, but I'll, I'll hold my hands in ways where people can't see where I've hurt myself because sometimes it looks really bad or I'll be wearing a plasters on it. I basically like for the past few months, I've been wearing plasters almost daily. That's the only way I have found to stop myself from doing it when it gets too bad because I don't want to, I don't, I, the, the goal isn't to hurt myself, right? So when it gets too bad, I'm like, okay, now I need to put a plaster on. Uh, I remember as a kid, I would also like, whenever people would say, would say like, oh, what happened to your thumb? I would be like, oh, I fell into a bush or whatever. Like it didn't make any sense, but I wanted to make it sound like it was an accident, that I wasn't doing that to myself on purpose because I felt very embarrassed about it. So that's one of my biggest stims. It's, um, it comes and goes, especially when I'm stressed. It's one of those self-injurious stims that I have. I don't have many of those, but it's definitely one of those that I would like to redirect. Uh, as some point to something healthier but I don't I haven't managed to do that yet so we'll see another one I used to have well let's face it I still have it another stim of mine is like nose picking so I mean it is what it sounds like not much to say about that <laughs> another thing I'll do is I'll wiggle my toes so it's one of those smaller more discreet stims that I've developed over the years that are more socially acceptable especially because they're you can't see it you can't see it because it's in my shoes but i'll wiggle my toes a lot even when i'm at home like it's it's one of my most effective stims even though it's a very small stim which is surprising i think i also like clench and unclench my muscles and like shake my muscles if that makes sense so especially in like especially like my buttocks i like to clench and unclench my buttocks and like like sometimes i'll be doing that it looks like i'm jumping sometimes like my arms as well like a, i don't know if you can show it like i'll do things like that i don't know if you can see it but like i don't know i'm tensing my muscles basically another one is fidgeting so that's a, another socially acceptable stim that I developed, especially in school. I was always either doodling, twisting my pen around my, my index finger. So yeah, I was always doing something with my hands in class. And another kind of um, fidgeting that I do to this day is if I, ca if I have any kind of paper in my hands or if I'm sitting down and there's grass around, I'll be fidgeting with that. I I don't even realize it, but like after 15 minutes, especially if I'm stressed, after 15 minutes, whatever piece of paper I had in my hands, I have shredded to bits. And and there's, if I'm sitting in, in on the ground, like there's no grass left around me. Another stem that I've kind of rediscovered that I do pretty naturally when I'm, especially when I'm overwhelmed or like confused or trying to figure what figure out what to do next is I'll do the finger flutter like this which also reminds me of ASMR but I'll be in the kitchen trying to figure out what I need to do next because like, the kitchen tends to be overwhelming for me because there's lots to do there's lots going on but yeah I'll be doing that another big one is cracking my knuckles and toes so that's another self-injurious stim that I would like to stop doing ideally but like I mean, I crack my knuckles all the time. Been doing that since I was a teenager. Not only on my hands, but also my toes. And sometimes I even crack my partner's knuckles, which he doesn't like. I'll be... Like, I can't do it now because I've done it not so long ago. There you go. But I'll be doing that throughout the day. I don't know, it's not something I can really stop doing like the skin biting one it's it's also something i got stigmatized for a lot my mom used to say that she hated it and um, some of my friends as well in school hated it when i did it but i couldn't it's not like i couldn't really stop doing it so i would do it anyway and they would think that i was being rebellious or i was doing it against them but really like i just needed to do it i have also like this is this one is hard to explain but i have stems with my fingers like finger and hand movements where um i'm like 
doing things with my hands i don't know like for sometimes i try to i i'll try i try to touch this part of my palm with my fingers like that also i have had periods of my life where i would play a lot with my hair pulling on the split ends of my hair and stuff like that i would play a lot with jewelry as well i have i have a bunch of piercings on my ears well i used to have one more here but it's gone so i i can i tend to play a lot with my with my earrings i have and also whenever i am wearing um a necklace or something i actually remember one time i was in a test in school and i was playing with my necklace while doing the test taking the test because i was stressed i was stressed and the teacher thought i was like hiding something so she she like looked she looked at me and i was like I'm not doing anything wrong, I was just playing with my neck because that stuck with me for some reason. Um, so yeah, playing with hair, playing with jewelry. So that's it for touch related stems that I can think of at least. The next category is taste. So kind of like the skin biting thing, I used to be a nail biter at one point as well. It didn't last too long because i really didn't like it that much but there was a time when i was really stressed and i would bite my nails a lot not anymore thankfully i also bite my lip especially the inside of my lip that's a more recent stem that i've developed these past few months basically like the inside of my lip I'm like biting like that it's interesting because that's something that my mother-in-law does and i picked it up from her somehow i don't know i am also very much sensory seeking when it comes to food on like food tastes and food textures i like sweet and salty things i like very spicy things i like acidic sour things like just the other day i was eating pickles out of the jar late at night and i put hot sauce on everything i love 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 my savory food i'm a savory food person. I don't have a sweet tooth. One of the um, traits of autism that is often mentioned is like looking for crunchy textures in food and that's something I definitely have and have always had. Um, I would also suck on my pens or my clothes or my hair when I was younger. I don't do that as much because I've become a bit of a germaphobe with age and I just don't put things in my mouth as much anymore uh, but I used to really suck on my pens, I'd bite my pens um, in school and my clothes and my hair I also had a bit of pica, if, if I'm saying that right P-I-C-A, which is basically when you eat stuff that isn't edible so I would eat grass as a kid i would eat hay the next category of stems i wanted to talk about is vestibular and it's another big one i'm a big vestibular stimmer um so if you don't know what that's like it's basically where your body is and space and like trying to stimulate the inner ear and like by by making movements with your whole body to me like vestibular stems are like full body stems so rocking back and forth rocking side to side rocking while i'm standing up rocking while i'm sitting down rocking while i'm lying down rocking in general or swaying is one of my main stems and it's something that i had kind of repressed that came back to me when i started um this whole process i remembered i used to rock when i was younger i had heard my mom say that children who rock back and forth look stupid and since i didn't want my mom to think i was stupid i stopped doing it sometimes as a kid i would lay i would lie on my back with my feet against the wall or something and just rock myself like that by pushing against the wall or something dana anderson mentioned that swinging like being on a swing set was a big stim for her that's also one that i really loved i really loved swinging as a child actually every time i i walk past a swing set in like a playground or i, I get kind of sad because 
I just don't understand why only children get to use them and why we can't use them as adults be, be you know besides the obvious reasons but I can I'm kind of sad that we don't have like adult swing sets or playing play areas things like that because I wouldn't use them a lot any kind of swinging rocking that's my big thing I actually had a thing at my parents house whenever my parents were away I would grab we had a pair of crutches in the house and I would grab them and I would run around the house swinging from the crutches um I loved doing that foot so much that was such a big steam for me another similar thing I did was there was a kitchen aisle and then next to it there was like a big piece of furniture and there was a ledge and um i would put one hand on it one hand on the kitchen aisle and just swing my legs and i would do that all the time when i was at home and it would drive my mother insane um i loved it so much it was one of my biggest stems another big one that i do is leg bouncing it's one i do every day and it's in a, it's another one of the more socially acceptable stims uh it just looks like you're very anxious or stressed when you're doing it i do it pretty aggressively but um yeah it's one of the most effective ones i find when i'm on public transport or whatever just sitting somewhere waiting or even at home I'll, I'll bounce my leg a lot when i'm happy i do the little fist like that and also i also clap a lot i don't know <laughs> like um, that's a big happy stim for me also like another stim that i've been rediscovering these past few months has is hand flapping or i don't know if it's really flapping like like doing that shaking my hands especially when i'm overwhelmed i guess something that has kind of come back to me as i started to reconnect with myself and something else that i Meg mentioned in one of her videos, several of her videos, she said that she has this stim, she has always had this stim of like when she's holding something in her hand, she's she's doing that kind of, and I've realized that I also do that a lot, especially when I'm reading, I'll do like, I don't know, I'll be rocking and I'll be shaking whatever I'm holding like my book or something. I'll be I'll be walking through the house with something in my hands and I'll go like that. But I had like a, a football and I would kick it against the wall. Like it was like playing football with against myself against the wall and I could do that for hours. There was something about the repetitive sound of the ball bouncing against the against the wall and like I don't know, I I could do that for hours. And I just I just loved to jump around and run and climb and so I was always climbing trees, I was always like running and jumping over stuff. I I would try to convince my my friend, my best friend at the time to whenever she would come to my house, I would say like let's do a jumping contest and like I would put objects along the road and we had to time ourselves while we ran as fast as we could and jumped over stuff. She hated it. I'm hypermobile as well. I loved anything that involved like twisting my body into every shape you can think of. I really loved gymnastics as well. I don't know if it's a stim, but I'll, I'll do like silly dance moves and silly faces. That's something I only do with my partner. Uh, another one is like headbanging. It was Autism from the Inside that mentioned that it's one of his big stims is, is headbanging and when he's out in public he'll put his headphones on and so it looks like he's banging his head to music which I thought was a really cool trick. Um, I also have that, it's kind of like the minimal, the minimalist version of, of uh, full body rocking. Sometimes I'll do like a really big rocking, sometimes I'll do like a more subtle rocking and sometimes it's just my head or uh, toe walking. It's, it seems to be quite common among autistic people, especially autistic children, a lot of toe walking. I used to walk on my toes a lot as a kid. For, for most people it's because of sensory reasons, but for me it was mostly because I liked the way it felt and also it kind of helped me to pretend that I was an animal so I would do a lot of toe walking toe walking 
and I still do the thing sometimes of like running up the stairs up and down the stairs on tiptoe when I'm standing for example when I'm 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 waiting in line somewhere queuing I will sway back and forth uh, like side to side and I will stand on the outer edges of my feet now for the facial stems those to me are more like I don't know if they're like nervous tics like anxiety tics I don't know but I when I'm really stressed I'll have like stims with my face so like wrinkling my nose when I first started making these videos a few months back I would while editing I realized that whenever I the, the camera is still rolling but I'm not actively talking like I'm looking for something on my laptop or something I'll start like doing facial stims again that I I repress when I'm like talking to the camera like this I don't do any of them because I've learned that they look weird but whenever I know that I'm going to be cutting that part out of the video then I, that's when I start doing it again I also do a lot of hard blinking sometimes with just one eye sometimes both there was one stim that I had at one point when I was a uh, when I was younger where I would shift my eyes in and out of focus i don't know if that makes any sense i don't know i i it didn't last very long i got stigmatized a lot for it especially by my half sister one time i went on holiday with her just the two of us and i was pretty stressed and so i was doing it and she she said like stop doing that you look you look weird whatever she said so i stopped doing it that day another big category is vocal stims we hear a lot about echolalia and i definitely have that i will like be repeating things from from movies like for example we did a hotel transylvania marathon recently and so for days after that i would repeat like blah 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 like like Dracula from the movie. Whenever I hear an accent, I tend to repeat it or when something says something a bit odd or something that sounds good to my ears or something, I'll repeat it, which um, has got me in trouble in the past because people thought I was making fun of them, I was being offensive, uh, but it's literally just repeating the sound that I just heard for the sake of it, for the fun of it. Uh, when my in-laws visit us or we visit our in-laws my in-laws um, because they have such a strong swiss accent without realizing it in the days that follow i will be speaking in a bit of a, a swiss accent mm. so yeah that's my echolalia i also do a lot of humming singing humming that's a very soothing stem for me especially when i'm like thinking of an embarrassing memory from my past i try to almost like drown out the memory with a sound that i make and it's often like singing or humming um i like to make like i like to make sounds um i like to make like high-pitched noises like sometimes but that's the kind of stim that i could only ever do uh when i'm on my own or with my partner i i i can't see myself doing it around anyone else I also do musical scales, I mentioned that in another video, but I'll do like and I'll go up and down the scale, that's a very soothing stim for me. Like the best combo for me, when, I'm, when I need to regulate my nervous system, I'll be sitting down, rocking back and forth, playing with a, a stim toy in my hands and humming at the same time. And I could even be listening to ASMR at the same time, that's like the best combo is when you do several stims at the same time. And then I have some mental stims, uh, especially when I was younger. I would often repeat a word in my head, emphasize a different syllable every time. So I don't know if I can find an example. Just an example, I was like, I would think peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter. <laughs> I don't know, like something like that. It was kind of ridiculous, but uh, it would stay stuck in my head and like I would repeat those words uh, over and over again or a sentence on, or something um, or counting in my head. That's one of the like, more of the, the mental stims, if you will. So that's most of my stims. Of course, I'm probably forgetting stuff, but those are all the ones I could think of. 
as I mentioned, I have some self-injurious stims that I would like to redirect. Also, when I was younger, when I would have meltdowns, I would like pull my hair really hard or like hit myself in the head really hard. That wasn't fun. Thankfully, I don't have those kinds of meltdowns anymore. I don't really hurt myself anymore when I have meltdowns. It's mostly a lot of crying nowadays. But when I was younger, my meltdowns involved a lot more anger and violence. And so I would I would hurt myself. I also had like OCD tendencies. I still kind of do, but less so than when I was a kid. For example, um, when I would, I would like, if I turned in one direction, as a kid, I needed to turn in the opposite direction to cancel that first turn because otherwise I was scared that I was going to enter another dimension or something. I don't know. I also had something with mirrors of like, if a mirror is reflected into another mirror, I had to hide one of those mirrors or something. So I don't know. I had weird OCD st stuff like that as a kid. Um, something, something else that is funny is my partner also has stims because he he has um he's undiagnosed ODHD he also has like vocal stims and so sometimes well a lot of the time one of us will start doing vocal stims and then the other one will mirror it or reciprocate and so we kind of bounce off each other like that which can trigger sensory overload because my partner can be really loud when he does that and so that like is really um, triggering to, to my ears but yeah that's something we do he also has like stims that i don't have like hair pulling that's pretty much it i think that's all i wanted to say about stims again that's my own experience with stimming not everyone is gonna have the same experience not every autistic person has stims to me it's been mostly positive to reconnect with my stims and I like it even though I still have a lot of internalized like ableism and uh, stuff like that. Sometimes I have some ne negative self-talk about my stims but for the most part it's been a positive thing especially when I'm out of the house and I'm overwhelmed. I will use my stims to help regulate myself. I will keep exploring my stims and like rediscovering them and I hope that you do the same. Uh, let me know in the comments what your stims are, uh, if you if you have stims and how you have rediscovered them or if you never lost them. Some some people just don't suppress their stims, some people don't mask as much. And so if you've kept in touch with your stims, let me know. If you haven't, also let me know and just let's start a discussion in the comments. I always like to hear from you guys. So I will link my um, Ko-fi page down below in case you would like to support my channel monetarily. Thanks for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.